Um, right, tonight's speaker, Susan Greeny. Susan's up here working um, at Renessa Brodger and was asked if she would deliver a talk um, as part of the condition of being allowed to that day at the Nest. Do you want to come and put your sister down here, guys? Um, and she said yes. And we're very, very fortunate that she did do that. Um, Susan is part of the properties research team at English Heritage. She tells me she's not become historic England yet, or is not ever going to become historic England. Um, and she also tells me today that she's had what seemed to me to be the most wonderful job you could ever think of, which is being a major part in the preparation of the new visitor centre at Stonehenge. Would that not just be the most fantastic thing to be a part of? when we all think it's so fantastic and so wonderful. Um, and in addition to being an archaeologist with the Properties Research Team, um, Susan's undertaking a PhD at Cardiff University, um, and this talk tonight kind of tunes in with the research that she's undertaken in the Neolithic Sienna Ceremonial Monument Complexes. Um, her supervisors are Alistair Whittle and Josh Pollard, and again, you know, like the Stonehenge connection, that puts a shiver down the spine of anybody who reads and enjoys any of this. Right, without further ado, I'm going to hand you over to Susan um, and <coughs> have some questions once we've heard what she's got to say. She's got many questions. Thank you. Thank you. Well, I was quite dumped, um hearing who your speaker was last week and hearing Richard Bandy speak. I thought, well, I've got to follow that, but um, hopefully I will do my best. Um, this presentation is going to outline some of the preliminary research um, that's taken place over the first year of my PhD. Now, um, as Anne just explained, I'm a part-time PhD student, um, just come to the end of my first year. So bear with me, quite a lot of what I'm going to be talking about is preliminary. Quite a lot of what I'm going to be talking about might be familiar to you already. Um, but it's kind of me sort of ruminating and thinking about the kind of theory and the thinking behind Neolithic monument complexes. And um, I'd like to try and outline the way in which archaeologists have tried to address these monument complexes, and particularly in relation to power, um, hence the title Powerful Places, question mark. Um, and suggest potentially new ways of moving forward in the future with, with thinking about these places, and, and kind of outline them, I guess, in a way what my PhD is trying to attempt to do. Um, perhaps you can write it back in five years' time and you can find out whether I've achieved <laughs> what I've been trying to do. Um, so I'm particularly interested in monument complexes. Now, what are monument complexes? Uh, these are places where people came back again and again over generations, over thousands of years, to construct and to use monuments. Um, and I'm kind of defining it as um, a landscape where there's a wide range of structures of more than one period uh, where they're found in very close proximity to each other. So we're generally talking about Neolithic, early Neolithic and late Neolithic monument complexes, some of which go on into the early Bronze Age. Um, now, archaeologists have spent um, entire lifetimes excavating and studying particular monument complexes. They are complex, they are complicated, they're difficult to understand, we have partial information about most of them. Um, so, not many people have tried to look at the idea of monument complexes as a whole, as a phenomenon, um, probably with quite a good reason, um, and that's what I'm trying to do. So, what made these um, such powerful places? Um, I hope you can see that, okay. Um, um, so Britain and Ireland have a number of very famous monument complexes, and I've just labelled a few here on the map. Um, there are many, many more than this. Um, I've labelled, for example, the Bend of Boyne, Bring of Boyne um, complex, the famous one with Newgrange, um, uh, just north of Dublin in, in Republic of Ireland. But I could easily marked on the other three major complexes that exist just in Ireland, at Loch Crew, at Carrickill and Carramore. Um, for Scotland, I, I've labelled Fort Eviat, but easily I uh, could have included Carnish, um, Kilmartin, Macri Moor on the Isle of Arran. There are lots and lots of these what we term monument complexes. Some of them are very famous, Stonehenge, Avery, and some of them are really only quite recently discovered, and um, discovered through commercial archaeology or wider aerial photography um, and, and geophysical survey projects. Some of which we know a huge amount about, they've been excavated, they've been studied, um, they're kind of the, the classic type sites which we all get taught about when we do undergraduate degrees in archaeology. Um, but some of them we don't know that much about yet. So just to zoom in a little bit further, sorry, just to point out if you didn't uh, sort of recognise them, your, your local site here. 
that's some other work on the screen. Okay, uh, well, on the top right, you have um, somewhere you possibly recognise. Uh, below that, the, um, the major hinges, three major hinges at Thornbury in New Yorkshire. Down the bottom, the big rings at uh, Dorchester. Uh, Newgrange there at the bottom left. Um, one of the monuments at Walton Basin, and then um, one of the pit alignments and post alignments of Fort Ely at the top left. So just to zoom in a bit further to the Wessex area, obviously somewhere that lots of people have spent many, many years studying. Um, here are the kind of key complexes. At the top left, there's um, some of the uh, remains of the stone circles at Stanton Drew, just south of Bristol. Um, we've got pretty, um, the quite famous pretty circles. I um, didn't know many people knew about it, but they got quite severely damaged a couple of years ago by the landowner. And there have been some recent excavations there, and hopefully we've made carbon dates um, from that site because of that damage, so every cloud. Um, uh, and Dorchester, um, Avery, famous um, Henge, Stone Circles, Silbury Hill, Avery. Um, a site at Marden, which is halfway between Stonehenge and Avery, where there have been recent excavations, mostly, most recently this summer by University of Reading's Field School, and Cranbourne Chase. So, and of course, the blue dot there in the middle can't label this Stonehenge. So this is my first initial area of focus for my PhD, but then I'll be looking out more widely in Britain and Ireland to look at some of, some of the other complexes. So I'm really interested in why people came back to these certain places again and again over time. Why didn't they build monuments in a much more scattered fashion? And, and why were these particular places so powerful? And most importantly, what can this try and tell us about, what, what can we um, glean about how society was organised? and how people um, were kind of related to these particular complexes. Um, okay, so I'm just going to take you through um, as an example, oh, that's not come up particularly well, hopefully you can see it better than I can, um, uh, the Stonehenge Monument Complex. Um, so um, this is a map, can you see it? Yeah, you can see it better than me. Uh, this is a map which um, shows the outline, actually, of the, um, the Stonehenge part of the World Heritage Site. And in the um, um, outline there, you can see some of the early Neolithic uh, monuments. Um, we have two Cursus monuments, which you can see in the centre. We have Robin Hood's Ball Causeway Enclosure, which is in the north at the top. And we have a number of um, long barrows, mostly, uh, well, all of them earthen long barrows, not, not your classic West Kennet stone chambered um, long barrows, but ones that probably had wooden or, or were just earth construction. And um, these monuments were all built around about 3500 BC. Um, we've got quite recent dates from the major Stonehenge curses in the middle. We've got pretty good dates from one of the long barrows, um, which we, we dated a couple of years ago, new, new dates on the burial there. Um, and they all are kind of around about that 36 to 33, 3500, 3500 BC. So already you can see in the early Neolithic here, we have what we could term monument complex. There are a number of different types of monuments, all within a quite restricted area of Solomon Plain. Um, just to point out that the long barrows, not many of them have been excavated in modern times, um, and where they have been excavated, they're pretty unusual. They don't seem to cover communal burials in the way that we might expect. Um, the, um, the long barrow at Winterbourne Stoke, for example, was excavated by an antiquarian, but he found just one male burial in it, one male inhumation at, at, at the end, the high end of the long barrow. And another one, Ames B42, which um, sits right at the end of the Cursus, was excavated again in antiquarian times. They didn't find any burials, but they just found lots and lots of cattle skulls. So these um, earthen long burials are not quite being used perhaps in the same way as we might think traditional you know, West Kennet style long burials might be used for communal burial over, over, over several generations. So we don't quite know what's going on with those long burials. Um, then we have a bit of a gap after, after these monuments are constructed. Um, before the next phase, oh sorry, I've got my pictures to show you. Uh, that's an aerial photograph of Robin Hood's Ball. Uh, it's actually on army training plans, you can't really get to it very easily, but it's still got its earthwork to preserve. Um, that's the long barrow at Winterbourne Stoke that I was talking about, so you can just about see the little bite taken out of it by John Thurman, who excavated it in the 1860s. Uh, that's an aerial view of the Stonehenge Cursus, one of only two Cursus monuments. Um, where we still have the upstanding earthworks remaining because this area has never been really subject to, to major agricultural um, interventions. Okay, and then we get into the late Neolithic. Um, so, so we have this bit of a gap, and then we have a whole burst of activity. There's one thing that happens in between, which is the first enclosure at Stonehenge, which is the circular henge, the earth bank and ditch. 
um, which is built in around 3000 BC. And from that time on, for a few hundred years, it seems that Stonehenge is used as a cremation burial place. We estimate about 150 people were buried at Stonehenge, between probably about 3000 and 2800 BC. Um, that's quite an unusual type of monument. There are some others in, in Wales and in southern England that seem to sort of match that kind of slightly circular enclosure with, with cremations, but they're, they're not very common. Um, but around 2500 BC, we get this massive burst of activity where all kinds of things happen in this landscape. Um, here's uh, Stonehenge. Um, I don't know if you can just point out, but just running down from Stonehenge is its avenue, which uh, you can just about see perhaps, um, and which leads down to the River Avon. We have um, the settlement at Durrington Walls um, to the northeast, which was discovered and excavated by Mike Parkinson and his team as part of the Stonehenge Riverside project. Um, Durrington Walls, known as a huge henge monument, but now we know that it encircled a settlement um, and a number of timber structures, all dating and, and in use for about 50 to 80 years, around 2500 BC. We have timber monuments like Woodhenge. This is a, just a reconstruction of the, the monument at Woodhenge next to the <coughs> Walls. Oh, sorry. And we have, of course, the construction of Stonehenge itself. The major sarsen stones and the blue stones get put up in about 2500 BC. I could go into the details of chronology, but it will bore you. Just so it, it, it's a burst of activity, lots and lots of things happening in this landscape all at the same time. So shortly afterwards, after Stonehenge is constructed, probably in about 2400 BC, we get the first beaker burials in the Stonehenge landscape. This is the Aimsbury Archer, who was found about four or five kilometres away on the other side of the River Avon, um, famously with a number of beakers with some of the earliest metal gold, ear gold earrings or gold hair tresses, um, and a number of tools that suggest he might have been a metal worker or a metal trader. Um, and shortly after that, the very first um, round burrows, burial mounds, early Bronze Age burial mounds. These, what the, the earliest of these mounds were erected over, over beaker burials, and they, they seem to have been um, constructed over a period of perhaps 500 years. We've got roughly 300 um, still upstanding as earthworks in the landscape around Stonehenge, mostly on the ridges and, and on the, um, the hills overlooking Stonehenge. So clearly in the early Bronze Age, it was still very, very important to be buried near to or within sight of Stonehenge. So what I'm trying to show you there is a sort of ebb and flow of construction of monuments. We get bursts of activity and then sort of nothing much is being built and then we get another burst of activity later on. And that's quite a broad overview and a quick run through of the Stonehenge landscape. But I think for quite a number of these monument complexes, Stonehenge included, we've got quite a lot of new data, new excavations, new radiocarbon dates, new things like isotope evidence, which allow us to construct quite detailed biographies and narratives for these complexes. We can identify these bursts of activity, and we can identify how people are kind of coming back to these places again and again. So part of my project is going to be trying to build these sort of detailed biographies for a number of different <coughs> complexes across Britain and Ireland, and trying to compare when these bursts of activity happen are there bursts of activity at lots of different monument complexes all at the same time, or is it a kind of staggered effect? So that's, that's partly what I'm trying to do. But another major part is to try and think about how these monument complexes can tell us about Neolithic society, about the people. So, I did add up a bit of change in the end. <laughs> um, so large megalithic and earthwork monuments have been, for a hugely long time, interpreted by archaeologists as reflecting particular forms of social structure and particular types of power relations. So their presence has been um, used to infer um, estimates of labour needed to build the monuments, estimates for the amount of, of food and equipment perhaps needed to, to construct them. And people have suggested that these particular type of very elaborate, um, large monuments um, uh, reflect greater complexity of social relations. So, the presence of powerful elites, the presence of priests, kings, chieftains, leaders, um, increased prestige, all of these things come along with, with early descriptions, particularly of these monuments. Um, so generally when we think about social inequality and how society is organised, there are quite a number of things that archaeologists turn to first and foremost. Burials is one of the easiest ways in. You know, If you've got lots of rich burials, you can perhaps suggest that some people were um, uh, an elite or perhaps especially treated and others were not so. But for um, most of the Neolithic 
and particularly the late Neolithic in, in Britain, we don't have any decent evidence of burials. Whatever they were doing with their dead, we don't really know. In, in the early parts of the late Neolithic, they seem to be putting them into cremation cemeteries, a bit like the one at Stonehenge, but only a very, very few people end up in, in that sort of context. What they're doing with everybody else, we don't know. So we, don't, we can't return to burial evidence as a, as a way of finding out about society. Another way that people have approached um, how to look at society is sort of by settlements. Is there a hierarchy of settlements? Are there cities and are there villages and are there scattered farms? But again, as most of you probably know, apart from up here, where you're very lucky, most of Britain, our evidence for Neolithic settlement is sparse. Uh, there are few and far between. Um, so Neolithic buildings, there are, over the last sort of 10 or maybe 15 years, uh, we've got a huge amount more evidence about Neolithic buildings, um, particularly in Ireland, but also in other parts of Britain. Um, the two reconstructions on the left show um, early Neolithic uh, halls or timber buildings, um, from, um, one from Scotland and one from southern England. Um, and these are often termed halls. They seem to be kind of quite large constructions, much larger than would be needed perhaps for a small family. Um, and the Scottish examples often seem to have been burnt, um, often preserving large quantities of grain. So some people interpret these as kind of communal houses or halls, um, but they don't seem to be kind of like small um, domestic buildings. They're, they're quite kind of um, complicated and might be, may be involved in sort of um, gatherings or, or communal events, um, perhaps to do with um, harvest. Um, that's as far as we've got with the, the interpretation. The two pictures on the right hand side, um, the ones at the top are um, our Neolithic houses that we've reconstructed at the Stonehenge Visitor Centre, which are based on the ones that were excavated at Durrington Walls um, a few years ago. And the one at the bottom there, that's a photograph from about a month ago when um, the University of Reading Field School have been li looking at the evidence from Mardenhenge. And that's their house that they have, which is a very, very similar size to the ones at Durrington Walls, but it's quite different. It has this incredibly large hearth, which seems to dominate the building, and this strange sort of stepped chalk platform. Uh, and the interpreter, sorry, the excavator, Jim Leary, has interpreted it as a kind of sweat lodge. He thinks it's a kind of building where people would go in and, have, and perhaps sort of, um, <coughs> um, in a way that Native American cultures are known to do, use this as some sort of um, ritual or a uh, special place rather than an ordinary domestic house. Um, that's his interpretation. Um, I think he's, he, he's kind of not basing that on a huge amount, but there is a large fire in the middle of it, that's for sure. Um, so, as you can see by these, um, the Durrington Walls houses were found within the, the henge of Durrington Walls. The henge itself, the earthwork, was constructed after the houses in the settlement had gone out of use. But they were amongst these other timber structures. Marden Henge, the house is actually built on top of the bank of a small little henge, which is within a, within a much larger mega henge, which has all kinds of other things connected to it. So they're not kind of ordinary houses in isolated positions. They're actually houses that are part of monument complexes, these late Neolithic ones here on the right. So we're getting a lot more evidence for the kind of, um, the fact that, as quite a lot of archaeologists get drummed into them, undergraduate level, and there's an avenue which leads down to the River Avon, which um, Mike Park Pierce has been interpreted. Uh, as a way of um, connecting into the wider landscape and, and to do with rituals of death. But whatever, they're, they're living, they're feasting, they're perhaps seasonally occupying these places. Um, huge numbers of people obviously gathering here. Now, the interpretation that is the most obvious one is that people are gathering here to build or possibly to use, take part in ceremonies at Stonehenge. And that's, you know, the dates work, the radiocarbon dates work for doing that. Um, but. What's interesting is that then the settlement becomes enclosed with this enormous henge monument, almost like the henge is finishing or kind of monumentalizing the settlement, making a mark in the landscape where the settlement used to be. <coughs> so we don't really have the evidence of ordinary domestic houses for, for the Neolithic in southern Britain. And so we can't really turn the settlement evidence to look at social hierarchy. So is it possible to infer how society was organized at all? How do how relations work without the evidence of burials and without the evidence of settlements? So I thought we could have a look at how archaeologists have attempted to do this in the past, and then how I think we might be able to do it in the future. Um, so, starting way back, we can look to scholars such as Gordon Child, familiar, I'm sure, to most of you, for his work up here and in very many other places in Europe. But he was one of the first archaeologists to write about the rise of inequality in society. And key for him was the production of a surplus. 
he said, chiefs cannot rule over a community unless that community can produce a social surplus above the needs of domestic consumption, sufficient to support the chieftain in idleness, i.e. as a full-time ruler. So you need enough food and enough produce to support people who are not doing anything practical, who are just there ruling over everybody else. He is not likely to be tolerated unless his rule can confer tangible benefits and the previous, that the previous system of government or lack of government fails to provide. So he's saying that if you're a chief, you've got to be a chief that everybody wants to have and likes and is, finds useful, otherwise they'll just be thrown over and they'll just be exposed. So that's one way of looking at um, So we, for, for Childs, agriculture was, was key. And he pointed to the Neolithic Revolution, as in the beginning of farming, um, as when the society began to get more complex. That's when you could have rulers, that's when you could have chiefs, that's when you could start building monuments. And there's this long-held assumption in archaeology that the economy is really closely related to monument construction. So it's the economy, it's the um, invention of farming that kind of wags the social dog, as it were. So the invention of farming means that you can do all these other things. Farming leads to a greater complexity and reduction of the surplus, and therefore provides the capacity to build monuments and to do slightly mad spiritual things. Um, so only really in recent years have people began to question this, and one of the sites that's um, helping us do this is Gebekli Tepe in Turkey. This is a, a monumental site with amazing temple complexes. In a way, I look, look at that and think, oh, what kind of look like a mess? It looks a bit like a mess. Anyway, um, amazing complex with these uh, little T-shaped columns, carved um, um, representations, fantastic material culture. And this site is actually sat within what's known as the Fertile Crescent, which is an area where the very first um, domestication of materials took place. And at the very beginning of the Neolithic, around about 9000 BC in that area, uh, we've got these fantastic monumental constructions already. And now, it might be, some archaeologists who are working on these sites have argued, that was it the construction of these monuments and the use of these monuments that led to the adoption of farming? <coughs> Is it because you've got to build monuments and you really want to build monuments, you therefore need the surplus and you need the extra people and you need the extra animals and the equipment and, and the spare time in, in order to construct the monuments? So is it the other way around? It's quite an interesting idea to think about. Um, so in Britain, uh, much of Britain in any case, not necessarily up here, but uh, there is a gap of a few hundred years between the arrival of farming, the arrival of domestic cereals and crops, something we kind of call kind of pre-monument, or sometimes people call it pre-pottery Neolithic, but it, there's, there's a gap of a couple of hundred years between about 4,000 BC and perhaps around 3,700 to 600 BC, when we're not really building these major communal monuments. We kind of seem to be just adopting farming and getting used to the idea before, before we start building monuments. But I think sometimes it's useful to think about how um, monuments could, can cause changes in both economy, technology, and society, rather than the other way around. So, um, other archaeologists have um, made more direct inferences about how large ceremonial monuments can tell us about society. So this is Richard Atkinson writing in 1960. I believe that Stonehenge itself is evidence for the concentration of political power, for the time at least, in the hands of a single man. He must have been a really persuasive single man, <laughs> who alone could create and maintain the conditions necessary for this great undertaking. So there's Atkinson saying, I think there's one bloke, and he's saying, we're going to build this. And he's persuading all these other people to join the task, to work as incredibly huge amounts of physical labour to transport the stones and build the monument. Um, and really, his, his opinion was kind of typical of, of the times, the 1960s. Um, when it was uh, sort of, well, usually men, I have to say, usually men that were in charge, chieftains, chief, chieftains, leaders, somebody really persuasive who manages to get these things done. Um, so there's an, a really nice ethnographic example which we can use to remind us that we can't really make assumptions about the construction of megaliths, the construction of monuments, and the kinds of society that we build them. These people are the Angami Nala people, and they live near the Burmese border in India. And they were recorded by um, an, uh, an anthropologist, John Hutton, in the 1920s. And uh, these are the pictures from his book which show um, the people, and these are the stones that these people put up. Um, and these people are an agricultural society, 
They don't have any hereditary leadership. It's all what we call achievement-based society. So you gain uh, power and sort of um, standing by achieving things and being, being an excellent warrior or being a good agriculturist. Okay. And the way that this works is that um, a, a person, usually a man, who has demonstrated his prowess in war, who has killed lots of other people and has basically proved himself, can go on to have a number of feasts. And these feasts culminate in what they call their stone pulling ceremony. And that's when the, a huge stone is hauled to his village and is set up as a monolith to commemorate his achievements. So each one of these stones represents one man and his achievements in life. And the, the point of it is that the man has to persuade or get together all his kinsmen, all his friends and family to help pull this stone. And they all wear ceremonial dress to do this sort of stone pulling. And the further away the quarry, and the more people involved, the more impressive the display is to everybody else. So it's not a case of, well, we need 100 men because that's how many people need to pull a stone. It's, no, everybody gets involved and everybody dresses up and we have a massive feast at the end. Um, the way that they do it is serve a lot of rice beer at the end, which <laughs> I guess is a way of persuading people to do something. <laughs> <coughs> so admittedly, these are, single, these are single standing stones. These are not, you know, the Ring of Guadalcanal. These are not communal large monuments. They're not stone. But they do show that you don't have to be a complex, hierarchical, hereditary leadership society to, to build monuments, to put up standing stones. So one way of thinking about social organisation that really held sway at the time that Atkinson was writing and, and through the 1970s and, and into the really recent times, um, particularly still amongst American archaeologists and anthropologists, was um, sort of neo-evolutionary categories of societies. So you get bands who are hunter-gatherers, tribes who are kinship-based groups, uh, chiefdoms where you have hereditary leadership, and then the state. And only at the level of chiefdoms can a small number of elites get together the surplus goods and mobilise human labour to create monuments. And the most famous attempt to apply this to the British Neolithic was Colin Renfrew. Um, he wrote a paper, a very influential paper, in 1973 about the monument complexes in Wessex. And he looked at uh, the labour estimates for building these monuments. And he saw each cluster of monuments as representing the territories of a chiefdom. And he proposed that over time, these territories from the early Neolithic coalesced and came together into one overarching chiefdom, who then basically built Stonehenge. So he saw that there was a change through the early Neolithic to the later Neolithic, of people coming together in greater and greater numbers into these kind of top chiefdoms. He was also quite famous for um, uh, drawing these kind of maps, Theseum polygons. Um, where he proposed that um, on, in areas like Arran and on Rousey and Orkney, um, <coughs> that um, the distribution of, of chamber tombs could show smaller scale segmentary societies in the early Neolithic. And he thought that each of these um, tombs represented a tribe, and each one had a, a particular part of the, um, the island and the territory um, to themselves. And then he saw in Orkney in particular, that the late Neolithic saw a kind of, again, a centralising tendency. So all the people came together and built this major monument complex, the Senate Brogar complex. Um, and he called that a potent symbol of both of faith and of secular unity. So he, he saw this as a kind of ceremonial site for the whole of Orkney. And I think that's perhaps, you know, influences how we think about the site today as well. Um, but Renfrew was making a really major assumption about monument complexes, which was probably wrong. Um, and he, the assumption that he's making, sorry, this is, this is the only image that I can find to kind of illustrate this. Um, the assumption that he's making is that each monument complex relates to a fixed social group, a fixed community, a fixed society, who are living in the area where the monument complex is being built. So here we have some nice little Lego houses next to Stonehenge to illustrate that. Um, so, that's, that's quite a big assumption to make, and we don't necessarily have the domestic structures, as I was explaining, right next to these monument complexes. Uh, and again, ethnographic records can help challenge this. Um, there's a really famous study of um, Madagascar um, by Morris Block from the 1970s. And he showed that people were burying their, um, their family and their, their sort of dead ancestors in tombs that were absolutely miles away from where they were living. They were taking their skeletons, taking their dead, and taking them to what they perceived to be their ancestral homes, which could be hundreds of kilometres away. 
So we can't necessarily make <coughs> the sort of assumption that people are doing things where they live. They could well be travelling for some distance. And actually, recent isotope evidence from sites like Darrington Walls has shown that people were probably bringing in products and produce um, from very long distances, even if they weren't necessarily travelling themselves. And I think the more evidence we get from isotope studies of skeletons, looking at where those people grew up, it seems that people were moving around a lot in the Neolithic, um, and we shouldn't sort of we shouldn't assume that everyone stays in one place. Um, so, I mean, people have written about that quite a lot. People have written about how causeway enclosures are on the edges of communities, at places where people, disparate communities, came together in these sort of sort of liminal, you know, in between places. Um, and people obviously had to live near to settlement, sorry, near to monuments for some of the time when they were building them, when they were constructing them. They have to have been around, but they may not have been permanent settlements, they may have been seasonal occupied, and they may have been quite unusual, and it might not have been everybody in society who lived in them. So, this is a, a classic kind of, I think it's about 19, mid-1980s reconstruction of Stonehenge being built. Um, so, archaeologists have generally seen sort of monument building chiefdoms, these are sort of 1970s and 80s ideas really, about a sort of unequal distribution of power. So the person in charge, solely one man or, or an institution, uh, this lovely leader here who um, seems to be based on Kirk Douglas, um, he's, he's sort of brandishing, slightly confusingly, he's brandishing the bush barrel most head at the poor chap slaving away behind him um, who are building a monument. That's a kind of typical you know, traditional view of society. So, so the, the people who are in charge, these leaders, are exercising power um, for the collective needs of the whole in order to maintain society. So everybody kind of agrees and goes along with it because they kind of need the leaders in order to keep everybody in order and it sort of helps society sustain itself. So this is often thought to be sort of how society works. So <coughs> there's increasing complexity, lots more information, lots more people, or maybe it's the time of a crisis. So John Cherry, for example, published a paper in the late 1960s about how monuments were often built at the time of crisis or instability, a way of bringing everybody together and creating a sense of community and sort of getting over a bad patch, as it were. Um, so the people that you can see in the background, the ones that are slaving away in the, on, on the monument, are sort of almost kind of dupes. They're, they're sort of basically tricked into believing that inequality is good for everybody <coughs> and that the leaders get to be in charge, but they don't really get to do anything. They just have to do what they're, they're told. Um, so, that's probably a kind of old-fashioned, I guess, way of thinking about how these people think now. Um, so, so the way that the presence of the you know the leaders are kind of seen as legitimate and natural leaders um, compared to everybody else. So, most of you may have um, sort of read more recent uh, return and processual ideas in archaeology about the importance of the individual and individual agency. So, the ability of people to make knowledgeable decisions about their own lives. So these chaps here at the back, in the sort of 1970s and 1980s, they're, they're just dupes, they just kind of have to do <coughs> boring, kind of heavy work. Um, but the people in the front here have got the, sort of, got the power. So there's a bit of a contradiction here. Um, how come these chaps at the front <coughs> have all the power and all the say, and the ones in the background <coughs> don't get anything? These guys have got agency in bucket loads, but everyone else doesn't. And it doesn't really work. Why don't these people resist or revolt? Why do, they have, why do they carry on building this monument? Why don't they just move away and do something different? So this was a bit of a, I guess a bit of a conundrum. I don't know if anyone ever framed it in that way, but, but um, there's a really interesting paper by Joe Brook, who's a, an archaeologist at Bristol University now, who, who wrote about this and said how it was this very strange contradiction between um, people who had, seemed to have lots and lots of power and all the knowledge, and some people who didn't. Um, so archaeologists, meanwhile, sort of turn to phenomenology, which is a way of sort of investigating monuments about space and how, how people move around and how people use and approach monuments. This quote from Tilly sums it up really well. How monuments and places could be moved around, approached and understood was a vital component of power relations during the Neolithic, serving to differentiate between those who were included in the knowledges required to decide for the landscape and those who were excluded. So again, you've got some people who kind of know what they're doing and maybe get to go inside West Kennet, Long Barrow, and shifty around the bones of the ancestors. 
some other people who are around at the front you get to watch, and then loads of other people who are just kind of out there being excluded and not being allowed into to the, to the key activities. So lots of people have, brought, have pointed out how Stonehenge took hundreds and hundreds of people to build, and yet the very centre of Stonehenge is really small. You can only get a few people in there. And if you've ever seen pictures of summer solstice, everyone's trying to jostle for that one little bit where you can really see the sunrise in a really good way. So there's a kind of contradiction there between all the people involved in building it and the ones you get to be in the middle. So scholars like Tilly and John Barrett and Julian Thomas have done lots and lots and lots of work about how spaces were arranged to exclude or include and to restrict movement and to restrict the ideas of people and, and where they could go. But to my mind, we still have a bit of a contradiction here, and that's what Joe was writing about, Joe Brooke. She was sort of saying, how come some people get to hold all the power and others don't? And how come some people get to access certain places and others don't? Um, so there's sort of there's two ways of looking at people here. There's there's people who passively experience monuments and have all their ideas kind of imposed on them, and then there's the other people who have all the ability to kind of you know make changes to decide how things are going to be understood to, to kind of have power over everybody else. So in my mind, I don't think that everybody is a passive dupe. I think everybody's quite um, capable of making their own decisions about what they believe and what they're doing. Um, and so um, people aren't passive dupes. So I think there's probably something else involved in these monuments that makes people um, behave in the way they do. So um, at the risk of boring you all, um, some theoretical archaeologists in the 1980s turned to this chap, uh, Michel Foucault. And he's been quoted a lot. He's very famous for writing about the Panopticon, which is the, the prison, the architecture of prisons that allows the prison warden to see all into all the cells and control people. But he wrote a famous book called Discipline and Punishment, which is about, about that um, issue. And it, that's often quoted by archaeologists. But actually, he wrote some really useful things about power as well. And one of the most important things is he again asked from the just in case you can't see it. Power must be analysed as something which circulates. Power is employed and exercised through a net-like organisation. And not only do individuals circulate between its threads, they're always in a position of simultaneously undergoing and exercising this power. Now, that sounds a bit kind of gobbledygook. But basically, it means that somebody in one position can have lots of power, and they might move the next day onto a different <coughs> situation with the people, and they might not have any power at all. And so people are always kind of in relationships of power with other people, um, and, and, and those things can change. And the way that he thought about power, it can be seen in kind of how the word power is thought of now, really, is as a thing to be kind of proud of, you know, um, girl power, black power, um, power of people, you know, it's, it's something that everybody can exercise and can, can get hold of. So, Foucault's quote here um, is actually quite close to some of the more recent archaeological thinking, something called relational theory. And it's about how things relate to each other, and about how people are always in relationships with other people and with other things. Um, and how very much it depends on the positions and roles of different people in society. Somebody might be, I don't know, let's take an example, somebody might be the chair of their local parish council, and in that particular meeting they are in charge <coughs> and they have all the power. But when they get home, actually it's the wife who has all the power because she's making all the decisions. And in another situation, you might be, you know, so you, you've got lots of people being in different relationships at different times. It's not just one chief. And um, the term for this is sort of a heterarchy. So people have different, there are different institutions, different societies. Somebody might have the skill that is particularly useful, a craft skill, but then they're completely um, excluded from a political decision making context. Or, you know, people have different roles in different places. So the way that people have thought about Neolithic society is that people have roles that are based on the family and based on kinship. But some archaeologists have looked at um, other ways of thinking about society. Um, Ewan Mackay, or Mackie, I don't know how you pronounce his name, he's um, been up and looked at the nest several times. He's quite famous for arguing that in the Neolithic period there was a full-time class of priests, astronomers, and <coughs> wise men, who were supported by the rest of the population, who, who had special expertise, and lived in residential centres at the Great Hinges and Ceremonial Monuments. So here we, I've just illustrated this with these uh, Maya astronomer priests who kind of fulfil almost this, this kind of idea um, that he's writing about. So um, his ideas are not always taken hugely seriously, but they are quite useful for helping us think about what kind of people lived at settlements like Durrington Walls, like the Nesbogger. 
Um, perhaps they're just a really select part of the population that gets to go and spend time in those places. Perhaps it's just women. Perhaps it's a people of a particular age or a particular specialism. Um, and perhaps only at certain times of the year or during special events and occasions. Uh, more recently, Colin Richards, who I'm sure has spoken to you on several occasions, um, has been writing and talking about house societies. Now, if you're like me, you tend to slightly switch off when Colin starts talking about house societies, but he's basically trying to think of a different way that society might be organised. And he's using the work of a French anthropologist, um, Claude Louis Strauss, who wrote about um, the idea of house society, that um, basically it's a corporate body, a way of organising yourself that is not based on kinship and not based on family, but based on something else. And the way in which he envisaged it was that your membership of, your, of that particular group is based on this idea of sort of corporately organised houses, great houses. And Collins will argue that this can be applied to Neolithic Orkney, uh, where he sees very strong kinship-based communities in the early Neolithic give way to a highly competitive series of groups based on house societies in the later Neolithic, when he thinks they've got more pop population and more productive farming. So um, these groups, he thinks, defined their identity by a focus on monumental stone houses and competing against each other for status. So competing and competition is actually quite an interesting thing to think about. Um, here's Steve Jobs. <laughs> um, you can't look at the competition and say you're going to do it better. You have to look at the competition and say you're going to do it differently. But it was a really useful quote to kind of illustrate the way that perhaps people like Colin and other archaeologists like Alison Sheridan have been talking about competition. Uh, you know, you build, uh, somebody builds Avery, someone else builds Stonehenge, they respond with Silvery Hill. You know, it's kind of, it's bigger, it's better, it's different. <coughs> different monument complexes are kind of competing with each other to be, to build the biggest or the more unusual or the best monuments. Um, I think that actually probably reflects uh, modern archaeologists' ways of thinking about their own study, in that I think people tend to look <laughs> at their own monument complex and think it's much better than any other monument complex, and it's sort of my world heritage site's better than yours, sort of thing. Um, but it, it also makes that assumption that we kind of looked at before, about assuming that monument complex equals a specific community that a community is living at a monument complex currently, and that represents their, them and their identity. Um, and sort of, what sort of scales are we talking about this competition? I think um, quite a lot of archaeologists say, oh, it's all competitive. Competitive display, competitive feasting, uh, it's all competitive. Well, what sort of scale are we talking about? Are we talking about small villages being in competition with each other? Are we talking about regional groups kind of competing with each other? Or is it somehow competition between monument complexes, somehow that uh, in some way that people have suggested? So it's widely acknowledged and, and thought that people have to come together from a whole series of disparate groups to build major monument complexes. Um, people have looked at the geology, the Ring of Rodger, for example, and said that potentially these are, are stones coming from a number of different locations. Silvery Hill is the same. There are basket loads of earth from lots of different locations that people seem to be bringing together in one location. That, so this idea of communal identity. Um, and, and, you know, people like Colin Richards have said that that's a show, that's a way of showing communal identity, but actually underneath there's a lot of tension and a lot of unrest and a lot of competition. And um, people have suggested more recently with some of the uh, most recent discoveries here in Orkney that some of these communities seem to have large walls. Is that to do with unrest and, and, and perhaps violence and perhaps needing to protect yourself? So it's quite complicated, but in my mind, if you're living cheap by jowl, if you're living at the Ness and someone else is living at the at Bar House and probably in some other settlements very close by, you're not going to be completely at each other's throats the whole time. There, there has to be some element of, kind of cooperation and getting along. And so I think these, these kind of, when people talk about competition, I think they have to be quite careful about who we're talking about and on what scale, because it, it probably is quite a lot more complicated than, than we think it is. Um, so I mentioned about the cattle bones from Darrington Walls, which suggests that people were bringing cattle, potentially also bringing themselves from a far away as the Scottish Highlands. <laughs> Quite a lot of number of times people have said, oh yeah, they come from Orkney, don't they? I don't think we've got any evidence that anything comes from Orkney. It'd be nice. I think people tend to make that leap between the Highlands and Orkney a little bit too easily. But um, certainly people were moving around an awful lot. 
Um, and we don't know whether people were coming together at particular times to help build these monuments, but it's quite likely people were traveling all over the place and visiting other complexes, helping it take part in a, a building project at an, one complex, perhaps going home, uh, you know, people are doing all kinds of different things at different times. Um, so I think specifically we have to think a lot about sort of religious politics and political religion. I don't think religion and politics can be separated in the Neolithic, they're kind of one and the same thing. And I think we have to be a bit braver about talking about religion and about politics um, in the Neolithic. <coughs> so in the last uh, probably about 10 or 15 years in archaeology, there's been um, a broadening of views on agency. Sorry, I've gone on quite a long time. I will wrap up very soon. Um, and there's been new ideas. Um, people might have heard of words like animism, actor network theory, materiality, relational thinking. Now, these are all kind of terms. Don't worry too much about um, what they mean. But as we saw a bit in that quote from Foucault, it's the idea of these kind of asymmetrical and in, a, in, in unequal relations of power between different people. And some have recently suggested that we can expand our thinking about power and about agency to non-human things. So landscape features, <coughs> animals, plants, <coughs> natural phenomena, celestial bodies, supernatural beings. So these things may have been seen by prehistoric people as powerful. Now that sounds a bit mad. <laughs> you know, the people, you know, you're t t talking now about a religion that we can't really get to. But, for example, if a society sees a particularly bright comet and a particular light, and they take that as a special omen that they need to build something there to mark that occasion, in a way, that comet, although the comet has nothing to do with it, in the comet's mind, uh, people will think that that comet is powerful. Somehow that comet is powerful. It causes people to do things. And it's quite possible that people in the Neolithic believe, we know from the alignment of uh, particular monuments on um, solstitial movements, certain materials like blue stones, uh, particular things might have been thought to have special powers, have part, be part of the religious beliefs at the time in the Neolithic. Now these things aren't actually powerful, it's only how people think that they are. So it depends very much on people, it depends on how, how they interpret the, the world surrounding them, and how they think about their religious beliefs, about whether they think things are powerful or not. Um, and in my mind, those sort of relationships between non-human things and humans have to be kind of repeated. And I think that's where you get the ritual aspect of things. Things have to be repeated for those relationships to endure and for those things to be known and passed on. So just to take an example, this slide shows um, the avenue as it approaches Stonehenge. And it rises, I don't know if people may have done the walk up the avenue, it's the classic thing to do if you go in the room. If you walk up the avenue here, ooh, I've touched it again. If you walk up the avenue here, where it bends around the corner, you actually rise up quite a steep little knoll, and Stonehenge kind of pops up at you as you kind of rise up that <coughs> rise. Now, if you thought that was a roadway or a path for people to walk up and down, You'd expect that avenue there at that little hill to be eroded into a little hollow way. If people are kind of processing up and down it every now and again, you'd expect it to be a little hollow, but it's not. It doesn't seem to be eroded at all. It's very strange. So why did they build an avenue? It doesn't necessarily have to have been for the procession of people. Perhaps it's there as a spirit avenue to bring things from the river in a supernatural way. Perhaps only one person gets to walk up and down it once a year, and that means that it's not eroded away. Um, Josh Pollard's recently written about this for the avenues at Avebury, where they don't quite join the henge. There's a kind of dog leg where the avenue joins the outside of the henge, and he suggested that that might have been because it wasn't actually for people to walk up and down, but it might have been built for some other reason. So there are kind of little anomalies and clues sometimes that things aren't quite as we expect them to be. So, um, to finish up, I'm just going to talk about the kind of potential sources of non-human power that might have been involved in the minds of Neolithic Britain, and sort of talk about how we're going to try and look at those in my PhD. So, um, first, how were monuments in these monument complexes placed in relation to natural features? Geological features, natural landscape features, watercourses, rivers, springs, and astronomical events. So an example of this would be the location of Stonehenge, at a particular location where it seems 
I'm not 100% convinced by this, but I think it is correct, that they were distinctive geological stripes <coughs> on the ground, which by coincidence lined up with the midsummer and the midwinter solstice. And that's potentially why people put the same edge where it is. Or uh, the Broadcaster complex in its very unique location um, on a promontory between either two marshy areas or two areas of water. Or perhaps the location of Silvery Hill at the point where, where several winter flowing streams, winterborns, become the River Kennet, it's the head of the River Kennet. So there's a number of different ways in which monuments have been located and, and used natural materials. Um, secondly, how did the past <coughs> influence the development of monument complexes? So um, this is a good example. The, the great cursor that I showed you on that map in the beginning of the talk um, was built uh, and dug in around 3500 BC. But about a thousand years later, it was redug. They dug out the ditches, they scooped out the chalk, they put it back on the bank to make it white again. Just about the same time that they're building Stonehenge, only a couple of fields away. And it's respected, you know, it's not built across by another monument. So they're going back to much, much older monuments and doing something to them. I think this is really interesting because what, uh, what did those people think about this 1,000 year old monument? Did they think it was built by people? Did they think it was some kind of natural feature? Did they, did, did they know what it was for? Or is it a completely new function that it's got after it's been cleaned out? But clearly it was important, and they clearly wanted to make it visible again. And clearly it probably influenced the location of Stonehenge. So you've got these, this relationship between kind of the earlier monuments and the later monuments, which is really interesting. Um, we hear archaeologists talk a lot about ancestry, um, which tends to be a bit of a kind of catch-all term. But there are lots and lots of different ways of perceiving the past. Uh, um, mythology, origin stories, genealogical histories, um, cyclical time, you know, there are lots and lots of different examples of different ways of society think about time and the past and history. Um, so one of the things I'm going to be looking at is how new monuments are placed in relation to older monuments. Do they obliterate them? Do they incorporate them? Do they align with them? Or do they completely respect them? Or do they sort of build them on top of it? You know, how, how do they relate to each other? And, and is that something to do with how they're memorialising their past or commemorating their past or perhaps legitimating the imposition of a new monument? There's all kinds of interesting things to think about, about the positioning of monuments in relation to each other. And then thirdly, um, connections, particularly to other monument complexes. Now, um, often when I tell people about what my PhD is about, they go, oh, yeah, those places have been studied loads. Why don't you do something when they want to study them again? Yeah. And I think it's because we keep studying these places and we keep throwing up complete surprises and telling us completely new things that we didn't think before. But in my mind, these places are unusual and they're unusual in their local areas. You get monuments, for example, um, henges, at places where, in regions where there are, aren't any other henges, and yet they are at these other complexes elsewhere in Britain and Ireland. So um, the power of the exotic is quite important. And also the power of things being the same. So thinking about the use of groupware all across Britain and Ireland in the late Neolithic period. So we know that people in the Britain and across the country were sharing pottery styles, exchanging particular objects, building very similar monuments, and it seems that the people are definitely communicating with each other. Um, so the monument complexes didn't develop in isolation. They're not just things that happen in specific regions. They are linked to and communicating with lots of other places in Britain and Ireland. Um, as we know, the blue stones were built, um, the blue stones that were used at Stonehenge were brought over 250 kilometres to the site. Um, <coughs> that Stonehenge <coughs> was very they used the roofware pottery. Um, and um, the, the burial of the mace head on the left at Stonehenge looks incredibly similar to some of the mace heads that you can see in uh, Kirk Wilkins from this museum at the moment. So you can see that there are, there are lots of links between these places, art, decoration, pottery, particular prestige objects, maybe I should put a question mark over the word prestige, uh, architectural styles, different types and forms of monument. So how did the communication links work between these places? And how do those chronological links work that I was talking about before those bursts of activity? And are they people in these different places treating the past and the natural features the same, or are they all quite different in different areas? 
So these monument complexes don't emerge in isolation, but they're part of a much wider connected Neolithic world. And we need to look at them together rather than in isolation. So by comparing the detailed chronologies of the monument complexes um, and it, trying to explore these different sources of power and these different ideas about um, connections and natural places in the past, I'm trying to understand a little bit more about the emergence and development of ceremonial monument complexes. Of course, I need to look back at more traditional ideas, feasting, the labour needed, the burial evidence where it exists, the settlement evidence where it exists, other evidence of hierarchy. But as I said before, there's not huge amounts of that. So to conclude, we shouldn't fall into the trap of making easy assumptions about what monuments can tell us about social structures. Monumental complexes were concentrations of social and political and religious power. Um, but we have to be a bit braver, I think, about talking about religion and about prehistoric beliefs and how people operated at lots of different scales of identities and different ways of being in living in the Thank you very much.